I'm Lisa Savage. Welcome back to Pathways to Progress. I'm here again with our new um, Portland City Councilors, Victoria Pelletier and Roberta Rodriguez. We're looking forward to having another conversation. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for being here. It's good to be back. Yeah, thanks for having us. You guys have had quite a week, right? Has it only? <laughs> yeah, a week. Has it only been a week? <laughs> I know the City Council meeting was very. Um, uh, contentious this week and there's been a lot of feedback afterwards and so forth but one of the things I wanted to ask you about Victoria if you don't mind talking about it is this whole uh, idea that you know uh, you're not the only uh, woman of color or, or specifically black woman even who's in an elected office here in Portland who's like hearing from people like you're not allowed to talk we don't want to hear from you your kind of reaction is but I got elected and I'm here doing this job. Are, are you hearing that kind of stuff from people? Yeah, I think it's been an interesting week for black women in Portland that are in elected positions. And I, I you know, I think it ebbs and it flows, but the, the consistent undertone is, is definitely a lot of feelings of racism, a lot of feelings of sexism, and definitely ageism for me. And it gets wrapped up into the emails and it gets wrapped up into the messages because I, I think a lot of individuals think <clears throat> like we got them elected so they should now be doing everything that we want them to do and in some way or another at times productive dialogue gets thrown out the window and then it's just kind of like why aren't you doing the exact thing that i want you to do and when it becomes when it's coming from a white person to a black person there's an obvious power dynamic there's an obvious racial dynamic and you know there are undertones that i think a lot of people that are white that claim to be allies don't see and don't understand but when we're on the receiving end of emails and somebody's essentially saying you are supposed to do this for me there is a sense of ownership in that that is that is traumatic for me and i'm sure for the other black women that are leaders in the city and so it's really hard to to kind of feel like, okay, I wanna be a counselor and have a dialogue that's effective, but I also need to make sure that there's a level of respect there and that you can understand the way that you speak to me is not okay. And <clears throat> so, you know, that's that's certainly been my experience in in emails and in messages. Um, and, and I think it's tough because of course, people wanna critique their counselors, which I think is fine. Like I'm, I'm, I'm totally, I know I'm gonna be critiqued. I know people are not gonna like some of the things that I'm doing, but I, I do think that there is a delicate line between making sure that at the end of the day you're recognizing the privilege that exists, you're recognizing white supremacy and white privilege that exists, and you're recognizing how you speak to individuals that are people of color, that are in leadership positions, in government bodies that weren't created for them. So like we're already breaking barriers every single day on our own, and it's hard enough with that because we're fighting through a lot of these systemic oppression issues that have existed long before us. And then at the same time, we're trying to be good leaders and good counselors with a majority white body that we're serving. And there's some there's some conflict in that. And it gets really challenging to feel like we can effectively make progress and have our allies support us in a way that is saying like, hey, I, I need to learn more about this vote. Can you explain it to me? Rather than being like, how dare you? This is what you were supposed to do for me. And like, now I'm gonna trash you. And so, yeah. Long story short, it has been a challenging uh, week as a public official, especially being a black woman. I'm sorry that you're going through that experience, but um, I really admire your courage and, you know, stick out. Perseverance. Um, I noticed in your Instagram stories, which are amazing, amazing <laughs> communication vehicle for serving your constituents and letting those of us that are not your constituents but we're interested really in on the process and you you know you're doing it live during the council meeting and keeping us but one of your uh, posts was like you know nobody has time to read a multi-paragraph multi-page thing just tell me you don't want to hear from me and you don't value my voice but i do not have time to read you know pages of this criticism mm -hmm. Was that, was that directed at one individual or is that kind of like a pattern that you're... Uh, no, it's definitely a pattern and it's definitely in ways I see how people talk about me versus how they talk about other counselors. It's ways that I see a, an email towards the council in the entirety and then the same email from that same individual to me. Um, and in that, there's a lot of offensive dialogue and there's a lot of things that that, that, this, that individual would never say to the entire council body, but feels comfortable saying to me. And so, yeah, my, my response is always like, if you don't like a black woman in power, I just wish you would say that. You would save us both time. Because I, I really don't want to read, you know, your, your essay on why I am ruining your city. 
Because again, like even that narrative of like, this is my city, like it's my city too. I live here and I'm an elected official. I got elected by a, you know, a large majority of district too. So I think if we're talking about like ownership, it goes back to this is a thing I own that like you are now ruining. And here's all the ways I'm gonna tell you that you're ruining it. But then to the entire council, it's kind of like, hey, here's some of my opinions and here's what I think. And then I'm getting an entirely separate email. And I've seen that on, on several occasions. So again, it, it just goes back to, I am always open to having a dialogue. I'm always open to being criti criticized. I get that that's part of the job, but there is a difference between criticism and then blatant either racial undertones or just blatant racism of saying like, you're a woman, you're a young woman and you're a young black woman in power. And I don't like that. So I'm gonna project all of my stuff onto you because that's something I don't like. Mm -hmm. You got uh, some pushback this week as well on uh, at least one of your votes on city council. And I saw in the paper that the reporter said, so they're trash talking you on Twitter. What's your response? And you said, I'm not on Twitter. They should call me, um, you know. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think like, like Tori was saying, is, is this, um, I think, misguided way to quote unquote hold people accountable? Um, I, I like Tori, I think I can appreciate when someone disagrees with me. Um, and I try to use my time in the council, like when I'm talking, you know, the five minutes that we have to discuss, to explain my rationale, right? To try to use that time as my point of transparency. This is what I think. This is what's leading to my vote. And I think that that's what I owe people, at least an explanation of why I'm voting a certain way. Um, and then when the response comes, if it's like, I disagree with you because X, Y, and Z, I'm like, I'll take that. And I'm, I think like that's a constructive dialogue. But when it comes down to like they're judging how you are acting, you know, whether you have your camera on, we talked about that, um, how you're a new counselor and you need to kind of just sit back and learn before you take the lead on something. Like those are the things are, that's beyond a disagreement. I think that that's part of that controlling, that's part of like, I pay your salary, you should do as I say. Um, and that, you know, there's tons of problematic issues that come up when you add race to that. You know, and in Maine, I think as someone that's not from Maine and now I'm in an elected position, you have that undertone of like, this guy's not even from here and he's trying to change our city. You know, and I, I think that that's incredibly problematic because it, it washes away the reason that we stepped up to do this work, right? We, well, I stepped up to do this work because I love this city because I think there's tons of potential and I see a lot of inequities that I believe we need to address and I want to be part of that work. I didn't step up here because I think I'm the smartest guy in the room nor that I think that I got all the answers. Quite the opposite, I just wanna be part of the solution. And in order to get those solutions, that dialogue has to happen. And it's not gonna happen by people just like attacking you. Mm -hmm. And certainly it's not gonna happen by us not calling out when those racial uh, uh, like attacks and undertones take place. I think that we have to call them out. And we kinda have to keep doing our work. Like we can't let that stuff get to us. We can't let that stuff, you know, like, like I've mentioned that I've become shy on social media because of the way that that works. And I have to be better at it, right? Because as living a public life, you have to be accessible. But at the same time, and I think that people gotta, I think there's gotta be a humanity, like a shared humanity that rises above all this. And they see the sacrifices that we're making to do this work as a way to kind of normalize the conversation. Like not attack us, understand that it's hard work and we might not always do exactly the way that you want us to do it, but we're putting all the effort that you elected us to put well, into it. Well, it would be impossible for you to vote every single time the way everyone that helped you get elected wants you to vote. That just isn't even possible. But it sounds like a lot of tone policing going on, which oh, yeah. is beside yeah. the point of policies and so forth. Um, before we uh, started uh, the show, you were telling me that there were some complaints about people turning their cameras off. Not just YouTube turning your cameras off, but counselors turning their camera off. Uh, and that that was unacceptable and you know but like how many hours have you worked by the time a city council meeting is it's at 10 o'clock at night I mean how many hours have you been sitting in front of a zoom screen that day that's a serious question I mean we've normalized this zoom life so much that we lose track of like that's not healthy to be staring at that screen you know my first zoom meeting on some weeks is like at nine o'clock in the morning and there might be a little gap in between them but they're back to back all day then at five o'clock i jump on a council meeting we're there until like 9 30 10 o'clock at night that's over 12 hours of staring at a screen mm -hmm. once in a while i want to shut that camera off and i want to take a deep breath or i want to take a bite of food or a drink and not have like a camera five inches from my face mm -hmm. and there's you know a lot of people say if you were in person you wouldn't do that and I've, I've ran meetings out of City Hall when I was on the school board. I, when you're, you goof off way more in person than you do when you have a camera five inches from your face. Mm -hmm. So the, I think that, again, that's something that the current reality, people are not acknowledging. It's not healthy to, and, and to then 
have this pressure of like, you better have your camera on. Like, I don't know, again, it's unrealistic. It's certainly not part of what people talk to me during the campaign. That was a big expectation. I'm not like <laughs> you to have the camera on. <laughs> no, right? We talked about affordable housing. We talked about <laughs> equity. We talked about real issues. So this to me seems like just above and beyond. Like, and Victoria, yeah. you've been getting complaints about where you're sitting in your home oh. while you <laughs> do these long, long meetings. I think people forgot that like, one, we're in a pandemic, we're doing our absolute best. I kind of thought we were turning a corner around, like we're gonna see people's cats in the video, we're gonna see the dog. I like seeing that stuff. I like, I like seeing, you know, what your partner was behind you cooking food. Like these things are normal and they happen. I can't create what somebody is expecting of like my own personal space. But yeah, I, I get messages like, oh, it must be nice. She's taking the meeting from her bed. Look at her. And it's like, I'm taking the meeting from my bed because I don't have a desk. I don't have a workspace. I'm in a one bedroom apartment. I have no room for a desk and a table to be able to sit down and say like, okay, here I am at the meeting. So I'm either from my bed, which is the only space with a neutral backdrop, or I'm from the couch, which are both very uncomfortable. And I'm trying to figure that out. But it's also, again, I think it goes back to ownership of saying like, if you're a city councilor, here's how you're supposed to be. And the reality is, again, we're in a pandemic, we're on virtual meetings, we are all adapting to new scenarios and what we call, I guess, the new normal. And so for the people that are upset that I'm taking it from my bed, like, would you, do you wanna house me? I'll come over and I'll do it there. You have a more comfortable space. But I am, again, really trying to make ends meet and in a space where I can be present for a five, six hour meeting. Um, and that happens to be from my bed or my couch. And so again, I think it, it goes back to people saying, you need to be like this and this and take your meeting from here and wear this and speak this way. And it's just not realistic. And, you know, I, I think it, it gets over the line of, of being offensive because again, I don't, I don't have those things. It is well, what it is. Bernie was so. telling us he gets texts during the meeting telling him to tell another counselor to do something. Mm -hmm. So not only are they bossing you, but they're telling you to boss Victoria or, or someone else. Yep. I'll, tell you, I'll tell you a story that I think like explains this in, in, in the most graphic way possible, right? One of my first meetings, one of our first meetings on the council, I get three text messages from someone that I've not heard from in months. Like I, it might have been, been about six or seven months. And the first text message was, tell Victoria to look up, it looks like she's falling asleep. The second message was, hey, congratulations on winning your election. And then the third text was, oh, by the way, this is so-and-so. And I'm like, did these come like out of order? Because the first one should have been, hey, it's me. <laughs> the second one, congratulations. And then, hey, by the way, Victoria. But they literally started with, go tell this black woman what to do. Yeah. And I was like, get out of here. Like, you yeah. know, like, that stuff is like so obviously like out of, like, well, like, there was plus the fact that what you're actually doing is posting those Instagram stories to keep the rest of us. Yeah, I, it's a, it's a, again, I understand the meetings are long and not everybody has time to sit through a five hour meeting but wants to make public comments. So I've started doing this thing on Instagram where I say exactly where we are and what's happening and when it's time for public comment so that people can get ready. And when I look down, it, I guess, looks like my eyes are closed. But again, I'm just updating my phone to make sure that I can help people who can't stay on the meeting for a long time but have something to say. And it's like, you can't please everybody no matter what. But it's like, oh, look at what she's doing. Tell her, tell her to open her eyes. And, you know, it's, it's hard because, again, we're on a virtual meeting and we're doing the absolute best that we can given the circumstances that we're in. Well, so. we've heard several people say how helpful it is that you do that on Instagram stories and it does help people, you know, stay with the process and all. Well, let's not spend the whole time talking about process. Let's talk about something substantive. And I'm just gonna ask you the very open-ended question. You guys have a five minute limit in the council meetings to give your uh, rationale for how you're gonna vote or, you know, say whatever you're gonna say. If you had more than five minutes this week, what would you have liked to say? What would you oh. have chosen to say and about what? Um, I've, I definitely have some thoughts about the tobacco ban. Okay, you, you say, one. I want you to say, yeah, yours first. Because I feel like I talked a lot. It was only like three minutes and 30 seconds, but I felt like I was talking for 10 minutes. So. Yeah. <laughs> to me, yeah, so we voted to put in place a ban on flavored tobacco in the city of Portland, second city in the, city, in the state of Maine to pass such a, a, a measure. Um, the conversation was actually really good. Uh, Tori kind of kicked it off with a really insightful look at how challenging it is, right? And she talked about being, um, uh, I guess, f frustrated with the different angles and how she was trying to separate herself from how, what the impact of this ruling would be, right, of this vote would be. 
Um, I personally felt like if I had, had more opportunities to talk, I would have probably elaborated more on what I had experienced in my community growing up and how the targeting of advertising towards black communities, so it's like uh, minority communities, um, and the impact that then that has on our health. You know, I, I have talked a lot about the, the work that I've done as an adult to improve my diet, to be conscious of like, uh, you know, my cardiovascular risk and all these things that I think I'm prone to have. And, and when I look at what I had growing up as influences mm -hmm. and being a Newport smoker since I was in high school and drinking malt liquor and all these things that we did in the hood, like all that stuff was purposely put in our environment so that our demographics would be hooked. And, and I feel like I was, I've done so much of my life to work back all of the ill effects of that. And I didn't do, I still don't feel like I'm doing a good job at expressing how that touched me personally and that I'm just here like crying because I know that other kids are experiencing the same pressures and without, the, without much support, they're falling, you know, for all the really effective uh, targeting that, that tobacco is doing and that alcohol is doing. And we're seeing the effects in our community. So I, I feel like I, I wish I would have been more thoughtful about my comments. Um, not even like have more, more than five minutes, but just be more organized about it. That was an issue that to me, I, I wish I'd have been more eloquent speaking on, for sure. So Victoria, if you had more than five minutes to talk about something in a council meeting, what, what would you say? Um, well, the flavored tobacco uh, note or speech that I made, because I was just like, ah, I was just really overwhelmed. and. And I, I'm glad watching it back that I made sense, at least to me, because I was a little bit concerned. I was like, am I making sense? Am I, do I, am I just like having a, you know, anxiety attack? So while I don't know what more I would have added to that, I, I think the thing that I liked from that and from just getting times to speak is that when I named being like anxious and stressed out with the vote, a couple of, a couple of other counselors, and I think the mayor was also like, I also feel like, thanks for naming that, because I also feel this way. And I feel like that was a really great moment for people watching to also understand that like these votes are very challenging. They're not easy. That one definitely kept me up. I was back and forth on it for a while. I thought I had the vote. I was very confident with the way I was voting. I had some more conversations and I definitely changed my vote because I went in being like, I'm not doing this. Like this, this makes no sense to me. I'm not even gonna bother. <laughs> and I think I said that to you a couple of times. I was like, I'm good. but. I started thinking again, is this just for me? Like, am I getting in the way of that vote? And I think thinking of, again, I have Reiki and King in my district, and that is really important to me because these are two schools that are very culturally diverse. And I was kind of like, if I can even help a little bit, 1%, 10%, um, I think it's it's my responsibility as a black leader to do that and to really make sure that I'm voting in the best interest of the district and not just my own personal thoughts on a policy that I don't know is going to be effective. And I hope that it's going to be. But that that was a moment of like having enough time to explain that and really wanting to explain it so that people who are listening are, are understanding that it's not just what we want personally all the time, again, it really has to go back to, is this gonna help the district or not? Is this going to be an effective thing um, you know, that's gonna support the district or not? And so I, I like that we get time to get to say these things about ourselves that maybe in the past other counselors wouldn't have done. Because I felt very vulnerable being like, I'm stressed and I'm anxious and I've been up at night and blah, blah, blah. And I just think that by naming that, we talked about it and I think we had a good dialogue on it. Everybody had stories about their vote and their experiences and, and that felt real in a way where I hope we can continue to do that going forward. Because that felt like these are just a bunch of real people that happen to be counselors, but we all have life experiences that lead us to vote a certain way. And that was a nice moment, I think, of like all of us kind of being in, in sync at one point and saying like, we're all stressed. This is this is not easy. So it was a very tricky one. It was very interesting hearing the public call in with the different points of view and yeah. cultural practices and so forth. I thought it was really interesting that the two big items on the agenda were pitting public health against commerce, basically. Mm -hmm. And um, both very different issues, one being the mask mandate for indoors and one being the ban on flavored tobacco. Um, it was interesting to hear your talking about it because you were really trying to fulfill your ideal of what did I run for office for? What right. am I here to do? And yeah. um, 
so that was interesting. Now, you two voted differently on the mask mandate. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you can handle the fact that you didn't both uh, vote the same on the mask mandate. Do you have other things to say about that particular issue? Or did you feel like you were able to cover it in the meeting? And So I think, I mean, I'll, I'll take this on. I, I'll, I'll uh, agree with Tori that there was something different about the conversation around the tobacco and actually the entire meeting. It was the first time, I shouldn't say this without like prepping at first, that I felt like the entire conversation on all the comments that were made by counselors were to explain their vote, not to try to convince people to vote their way, which in the past we've seen a lot of that. It kind of translates into like, like these people don't understand it, I get it right, agree with me. And the conversation that night was, was not that way. On the mask mandate, um, yeah, we, this is actually a really good example, right? Because we said earlier, like, people, are we like the you progressives to vote a certain way? And then here we are, two progressives voting different ways and issues for different reasons um, and viewing it separately. I think that I totally respect the way that Tory voted. I, for me, it wasn't an easy vote. It wasn't like a, a slam dunk that I was going to, to move away from the mass mandate. Um, I thought I did a good job at explaining my rationale, which was based on the hospitalization rates and the trends that we're seeing. Um, but again, you know, obviously ended up somewhere different than, than my colleague. I, don't, I won't claim to have been right. I won't have claimed that she was wrong, but I, I thought I did a good job at explaining myself. And again, that's my goal at the end of the day, that to be clear about why I chose a certain vote. Yeah, I think for me, um, for that mask mandate conversation, I maybe would have spoken a little bit more. I, I definitely shared where I was coming from, and I, I definitely was listening to Director Dow and the numbers that she was given. But I think something that people also forget is Maine Med is in my district, and so I'm getting... I'm getting the nurses and the doctors and those are the emails and the calls that I'm getting. And it can be vastly different because it's my district, I'm their district counselor of where they work versus I think some of the other counselors who maybe aren't hearing or aren't really in the middle of, of those conversations. So I, I think I, I kind of wish I put that out there for the people that maybe forgot because there were certainly, um, there was pushback on that. There was pu pushback because I'm sponsoring the hazard pay amendment. People were like, of course, she's going to vote for it because she wants her hazard pay. And, you know, the reality is I've wanted a mask mandate since September, since before I was even elected. And like I, I've been quoted many a time when we were campaigning saying that. And, you know, I was going based on the, the numbers that Director Dow gave us. And I was also going based on the fact that while we were trending well, I certainly didn't think it was time to like be like, we're good. We can remove the mask mandate. I thought we were going in the right direction, but I think we were going in the right direction because of the mask mandate. And so I, I would have loved, I guess, to have talked about that a little bit more. Um, but, you know, I, I think looking back differently, I put a lot of energy into explaining the flavored tobacco, and I certainly explained my piece on the mask mandate. But I think because I talked so long about flavored tobacco and I didn't talk as long for the, about the mask mandate, that some of my reasoning got a little bit missed. And so I think looking back, that's probably what I would have talked about more. Well, it is a complicated issue because the hazard pay is in there, which was passed by referendum in Portland, but it's dependent on there being a state of emergency, which the mask mandate is perceived as being sort of a, a marker of an emergency. It isn't necessarily, but that's the way it's seen. And then also the commerce, you, uh, we heard, you heard from many small business owners going, I'm God, this, I'm enforcing this and my employees are being, you know, abused verbally and they're f afraid for their safety. And, but then other people saying, well, that's the only reason I'm shopping locally. That's why I stopped shopping online and went into stores again because I felt safe because, so they're really complex issues. They can't really be boiled down to like, you know, the right side is right and the wrong side's wrong. I have a lot of respect for both of you for being able to appreciate those nuances, take in information from a lot of different sources, and then be able to talk about your reasoning. That It's not easy to do. Yeah, I, I think the thing that's the hardest that I'm learning as a new counselor is that none of my votes are ever 100%, but they have to be in that moment or I'm either like yes or no. And I sometimes wish I could be like yes, but, or no, not yet. And instead of being feeling so concrete, like for example, the mask mandate, I don't want to exist with masks forever, but I wish there could have been a way that's like just for a little, you know, just a little longer and, and like let me say yes now, but that doesn't mean yes in, you know, for the next three months. And so I, I think it's, that's what I'm learning as a new person is that even though we make our points in the meeting, not everybody's watching the meeting. So all they see is the headline the next day saying she said no to that or she said yes to that. And then that's driving some of the anger too of saying, how could you? But 
if people watch the meeting, it's kind of like we say my piece. That's why I try and cut some of the stuff I say and like share it on social media. Cause I always want to say like, here's why I'm voting in this way or not voting in this way. But yeah, it's hard because nothing is ever like one or the other. We have a lot of gray area that we don't, we don't get the luxury of like picking the gray area as a counselor. Maybe ranked choice voting could help with that. You know, you could rank your things. Like, That'd be yes. so funny. It's like, okay, everybody look at your papers and we're I know. holding up. <laughs> Then I should. <laughs> I'm actually like that. Oh. <laughs> so what's on the horizon? What the thorny issues do are you grappling with next? Uh, uh, I mean, the hazard pay is going to be. A, I'm, yeah, I'm taking it to the end. <laughs> it's going to be a, um, a a challenging conversation. We are going to be voting and discussing that on the 28th. I look forward to the conversation regardless because I think, again, we didn't get enough chance to talk about it. It's a really important thing that whether people are voting for it or not, that I think is important for us to discuss um, and, and have on have on the table. So I think looking forward to the end of the month, which is our next meeting, that's probably going to be, I would assume, the biggest discussion and item and vote on the agenda because it's already kind of bubbling up and people are discussing it. but. I'm sure between now and then there'll be something else as yeah. well that will come up. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, and, and to that point, I think that I agree with Tori. I think that the hazard pay, when we have that discussion, I think it's an important one. And I think that it, it hopefully we gain something valuable out of it, even if it's not like necessarily gets the votes and it passes. I think I agree fundamentally on like the most effective way to, to, to help marginalize people is to increase wages, right? Because it's kind of like that rising tide. Uh, effect um, to which I will always say, you know, some anchors are heavier than others, right? So the rising tide doesn't lift all ships equitably. Um, but I, I personally have had this idea that when wage increases happen, you know, in bubbles like that, like in small communities, that they also have a negative impact in those same marginalized communities that we're trying to to impact. So I, I'm looking forward to diving into that, so that I can, when I say that say it not in the, you know, I have a hunch that this could hurt them, but like, let's dig in. Let's say, is that true? Um, and then with the right information, perhaps I become kind of like the A Tory, we gotta take this like stronger. But absent that, com absent that conversation and that knowledge, um, I think that we're ill-equipped to make the right decision. Uh, at least I find myself. So I, I'm looking forward to doing it, to having that conversation, even if it seems right now like there's not like a clear path forward for it. So you would like more information on the effect of total jobs that are available or whether small businesses have to close or that is that the kind of information that you're thinking yeah, so would really I, help you make an informed decision? Yeah, my fear of like having a local uh, hazard pay increase suddenly is, you know, people's hours will be cut jobs will be lost, and then the cost will be passed on to the consumer, at which at the end of the day, you and I are no better off, particularly those, those people that are, that are really struggling to make ends meet. So if that assertion is accurate, I'd be, I'd be more cautious to advance it. But if what I'm saying is not proven, like if, if there's not like a, a proven argument behind that, then maybe putting a hazard pain in, in place is something that 100% that want to put in. Um, having said all that, like I said at the beginning, I 100% agree that increasing wages across the board is the most effective way to help people. Sure. But that's not hazard pay. That's exactly. increasing the minimum wage. Which I also believe in. So. Totally, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's very often the case that when voters pass something in a referendum, either at the municipal level or the state level here in Maine, the uh, legislative body fails to enact it. Sometimes it's seen as an act of bad faith. Sometimes it's seen as an inevitable occurrence because conditions have changed or the referendum item wasn't written in a way that is, you know, it can be enacted. We've seen it uh, in Maine many times. So. Um, I think I can see that process playing out here in Portland, and it's very easy for people to say, hey, we elected you to do this, but uh, doing that thing uh, involves a lot more than someone marking a ballot in the, mm -hmm. uh, on election day. Yeah, and, and I think with that too, like I'm bringing it to the finish line, regardless of what way it goes, because it got left. It got left in the conversation, and so, whether people like it or not, I'm bringing it all the way to the end. And, and with the beauty of a democracy and a city council is we all get a vote. And that's the fairest way to settle whether or not we're actually going to implement it. You know, there are many other conversations around that that I think we need to have. But and I think the other thing is we got elected like we're allowed to bring ideas to the table. And it's like if you don't like it, then you don't have to vote for it. But I think there's this thing of saying like, no, don't do that thing. 
But it's like, if I'm not doing this, then I'm fully willing to have conversations around other ideas. But I do think that we have huge issues with wage disparities. And I think that ties directly into systemic racism and classism. I would love to talk about it. I would love to implement it in some way, whether it's in my council career or, or you know, in another. But I, I think that we have a lot to talk about. And the exciting part about being in a city council and being a new person on the council is you, you can bring new ideas to the table and you could bring ideas that maybe people think are radical ideas. But if, it, if someone doesn't like what I'm bringing to the table, I, I would love like bring something else, bring something else that, to the table that you think would be effective and then let's work together to implement it. But I think it's like this is part of being on the council is trying stuff and seeing if it works and seeing if it doesn't and having those conversations about it. So. Again, I think with, with Hazard Pay, I just look forward to, to talking about it. Well, bringing it creates the space for people to have the conversation and to yep. find out more than they knew. And, yep. and so that's got to be a positive, right? Um, yeah. Well, this has been a great conversation. Um, our time is up, but thank you so much. I hope that you'll come back again. Thank you for joining us. Pathways to Progress with Victoria Pelletier and Roberta Rodriguez talking about their uh, city council experiences. And uh, we appreciate your listening in. Thanks a lot.